Jesus says that I will reveal myself. And as he reveals himself, we see wonderful things as we come to know our Lord. And we pray that during this worship time, God will reveal himself to you. We begin now with the opening hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful merciful God, God, we confess confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. 
to those who believe in Jesus Christ. He gives the power to become children of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. First reading comes from the New Testament in the book of Acts, in chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, 
What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now, what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. We recite our congregational memory verse. Joshua 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, 9. Our epistle reading comes from the first letter of Peter in chapter 3. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. It was only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not by the removal of dirt from the body, but by the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the Holy Gospel, we read in St. John chapter 14. Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. We now continue for a message for our children. So, welcome to the children's message time, and uh, I'd like to start off by reading to you from John chapter 14, beginning at the 15th verse. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commands... And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. So Jesus promises us a comforter. That is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth who leads us into all truth because he's the one who brings us to faith. The comforter, our Lord Jesus Christ, descends. The Holy Spirit comes to us. But sometimes the problem we have with the Holy Spirit is that we can't see him. So does the Holy Spirit really exist? Is he really there? If you can't see him, where is he? Is he really with us, as Jesus promised? Well, I can't see him. It's a a strange thing for me these days to uh, do children's time this way with no children present with me. You can see me if you're watching on TV or watching on your computer screen, but I can't see you. And so does that mean that you don't exist? Well, you would say, sure, I exist. I'm right here, but I can't see you. I don't know where you are. But that doesn't mean you don't exist, does it? And I know you exist because I've seen most of you before. And I've seen evidence of that you exist when uh, you've drawn nice pictures or done some kind of other artwork that I've seen later on. I've seen what you've done. I know that you must be because somebody did that, and it must have been you. And that's one way I can tell you exist, even though right now I can't see you. It's maybe something like this. The Holy Spirit is the wind or the breath that comes. He's the one who keeps moving. But we can't see wind. And uh, that doesn't mean, though, that it doesn't exist. So I've got these three pieces of paper here. And you see, if I hold them down, not much happens. They just kind of hang there. But if I turn on this fan, look at what happens. Look at this. They can't keep them still. They're blowing all over the place. There's no way I can have them just hang straight down. Now, can you see that wind blowing in, the, in those pieces of paper? Of course you can't. You can't see them, but you can see what it does. And that's how it is with the Holy Spirit. While we can't see the Spirit, we can see the evidence of him. We first of all know that he's there because Jesus promised us that the Holy Spirit is with us. And so we know that we have them just from what Jesus said, but we can see the evidence of them. Just like you could see that paper blowing around, you could see the evidence of the wind. We can see the evidence of the Holy Spirit in the way he works in people's hearts. One way you can tell for sure the Holy Spirit has been someplace is when somebody believes in Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's work. He's worked faith in that person's heart. And as the Spirit works more and more in us, we get to see how he works, uh, works so that we live in love for one another and grow in doing that. And the evidence of the Holy Spirit should be seen 
more and more all the time. He really does exist, even if we can't see him. We can see what he's done, and we know Jesus' promise that he has sent us, so that we know that he really is, and he really is with us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit. Help us to realize that even though we can't see the Spirit, even though we can't see you, Lord, we know that you are, that you do exist, and that you are with us. We thank you for that, Lord, and I pray that as you work in us, we would be more and more living as you are, Lord, being more and more loving day by day. Thank you. Amen. Our worship continues with the next hymn. Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was, uh, oh, somewhere in the range of eight or ten years old, I had a friend who went with his family on vacation to the Grand Canyon. And when he came back from the Grand Canyon, he showed me pictures of the canyon. And he said something, obviously, I've never forgotten, probably won't ever. And that was this. He showed me the pictures and said, you can't tell how big it is from the pictures. You have to see it. 
And it was many years later when I finally got a chance to see it. We had driven all day, and it was late in the day, but there was still time as we had drove in the park to come up to the Grand Canyon. And just as we were about to get there, we were stopped by construction. We were in the park. Uh, at the moment, I didn't know how close we were. We were just yards away from the Grand Canyon. And it uh, seemed like a very long time we had to wait, so there wasn't much time when we finally got to get to the edge of the Grand Canyon. But what a sight. My friend clearly was right. You can't picture how big it is until you see it. It was an amazing sight. There are many amazing sights in our world to see. But the greatest sight is to see God himself. And you can see God. You can see God with the eyes of faith because God reveals himself to us. God reveals who he is. He reveals himself to us. Listen to what Jesus says here in John 14. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. Jesus says, I will reveal myself. And so he does. Jesus reveals himself to us and to others in, a, in amazing ways, especially as he's walking here on the earth, how he reveals himself to us. Jesus reveals himself by telling us who he is, by saying it. And sometimes it seems to us that when Jesus reveals himself by saying who he is, it seems a little oblique to us. It doesn't seem so direct. So often, Jesus refers to himself in the third person when he says, the Son of Man this or the Son of Man that. But there was plenty of precedence in the Old Testament that the Messiah, the Christ, would be the one who's known as the Son of Man. One of my favorite times when I think of Jesus revealing himself by what he says is when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. How powerful that is. And if there's any doubt about who Jesus is saying he is, when he says, I am, before Abraham is, I am, I am being the name that God had given to Moses many hundreds of years after Abraham, but still his personal name. If there's any doubt that people understood what Jesus was saying, what he was claiming to be, that he was claiming to be God, it's in the reaction of the people who didn't believe him because they wanted to kill him. They blamed him of blasphemy, of claiming to be God, which of course he was, but they didn't think he was God. That's why they wanted to kill him. No, Jesus was very clear in what he said. He made it clear that he is God himself. He revealed himself by the way he spoke about himself. But he also revealed himself in the miracles that he did. He reveals what great power he has. As with a word, he stops a raging storm. What power to have power over the nature that he had created. What power he has as he does so many miracles of healing people, of all kinds of diseases and so many people. He heals them left and right. He shows what kind of power he has as he does it. And how he shows his power and opens the spiritual eyes of thousands as he feeds thousands with a few loaves and a few little fish. He is the, the great God himself. And it's not evident even in that. He shows us who he is by the way he teaches. And he teaches with such wisdom and knowledge and authority that people could tell it was completely different from the way the scribes taught. This one's different, and you could see it in what he said and what he did. He reveals himself in all those ways. How amazingly he reveals himself to us as he's suffering and dying on the cross. He is revealing himself to us so that we can know that he is the one 
true God who dies to take away our sins. What a revelation. How deeply he loves us as he dies on that cross. When a guy uh, tells a girl for the very first time that he loves her, he's taking a bit of a risk. How is she going to respond? He takes a risk because he reveals himself. He reveals what's within him. He reveals his feelings for her. He reveals his love for her. And so God reveals himself on the cross to each of us. He reveals how deeply he loves us. We heard it read in 1 Peter before, where we hear this about Jesus dying for us. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. In his dying for us, he reveals his deep love for us. Jesus didn't need to die. He had done nothing wrong. He is the righteous one. And the one who is righteous dies for us unrighteous ones. Ones who don't deserve anything to be done for us because we are unrighteous. We have not done anything to deserve it. Quite the contrary. We don't deserve his love at all, but he loves us so deeply that even though we are not righteous and he is perfectly righteous, he dies for us. He takes our sins upon us. And he does it because he loves us and he does it so he can bring us to God. This is how Jesus reveals himself most beautifully. And then he reveals himself in a way that we don't often talk about. He he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. (laughs) Jesus even reveals himself to the spirits in hell. He proclaims victory over sin and hell. So he reveals himself also to them. But we're more interested in how he reveals himself to us. And we love what comes next, as uh, Peter refers to it in verse 21, about how Jesus rises from the dead, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see great power exercised in a way that was by most, if not all, not expected. Remember about Clark Kent, that uh, bumbling, weak guy with glasses that he had to keep pushing up all the time? Clark Kent, who was uh, so weak, when uh, his friends find out that he's really Superman, when that is revealed, it's such a great surprise to them. Similarly here, we see Jesus on the cross, so very weak. He's so weak that uh, he finally dies on that cross. He'd been beaten up and, 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 and hit a lot, but even so, just weakness. He finally dies, not able to take another breath. He's dead. How much more weak can you be than that? But when he rises from the dead on the third day, what a revelation! How revealing it is! How wonderful this revelation! That Jesus is alive. That he has the power to come back to life. That goes way beyond any power Superman had. Power to come back to life, to give life, for he's the one who gives life in the first place, who's made the world and everything in it. He is the almighty power, God himself, who rises from the dead, victorious over the grave, victorious over death and sin and hell and Satan, and all that horde. He has great power. And how revealing it is. Jesus reveals himself to us as our Savior, as the one who loves us deeply, as the one who will be with us forever and ever. And how about us? Do we reveal ourselves? Do we let people know who we are and whose we are? Is it obvious? Is it clear that we are Christians? One of the very first television game shows was a show called What's My Line? And on this show, 
which started way back in 1950. So you know it's in the early days of television. On this uh, game show, What's My Line, there would be four panelists who would uh, try to guess the, uh, the uh, line, the line of work, the line of profession that the person that the guest would be on, on hand. It would be two or three guests, I guess, on each, on each uh, episode. And uh, these guests would usually have some very unusual uh, line of work, and so it would be hard for them to guess, and they were trying to guess it within 10 guesses. Who is this person? They'd have a guess that could only be answered yes or no, and finally they might come up with it, or, or maybe they'd be surprised and couldn't. And then to, to kind of um, make things interesting, every, one, every once in a while, uh, what's my line would have a very famous person come on the show, and the panelists would have their eyes blindfolded, and the, the, the famous guest would try to disguise his or her voice, and the panelists would try to guess who it was uh, by, again, those yes or no answered questions. What's my line? Do people have to guess who you are? What's my line? It ought to be very obvious. People ought to see who we are since God lives within us, since the Holy Spirit has been given to us as Jesus promised. People ought to be able to recognize that we belong to God by the way we live our lives, by the way we show love for everybody around us. That ought to be very clear. People shouldn't have to guess. And not only should we show it by the way we live, but also tell people the good news about what Jesus has done and how we ourselves believe it, that we might uh, tell others the good news. We want to reveal Jesus to those around us. When a great artist has been commissioned to do some special piece and uh, it's covered up and then the cloth is removed at the last minute and you can see the masterpiece, it's a uh, quite a revelation, very revealing. This is what St. Paul did with so much of his life. He revealed the masterpiece, the master himself, God himself. St. Paul revealed Jesus to the people as he went from town to town to proclaim the good news about what Jesus has done. And uh, we read about how Paul was in Athens proclaiming the good news to the people there. It's interesting how he uh, tries to reveal the masterpiece to the people in Athens. Uh, the people in Athens had all kinds of uh, false gods that they worshipped. They were very busy in making shrines for the false gods and making the false gods themselves even, making altars to this and one and that. And, and Paul begins as he tries to talk with these people and relate with them, and he, he talks about how, I see you're a very religious people. And uh, Paul says, I see that you even have an altar to an unknown God. It seems as if the people who worship so many different gods wanted to uh, cover all the bases and make sure they didn't miss out on one so they made an altar even to a God that they don't know. So Peter says, I'll, or Paul says, I'll, uh, I'll tell you who this unknown God is. He's the one who made the heavens and the earth and everything in them. He doesn't need something made with human hands to, uh, to give life and breath to everything. He is way beyond that, way beyond these gods that you know. And Paul says, he's not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and are. We exist in him. Paul is uh, revealing Jesus to these people, helping them to understand. He goes on to talk a little bit long, longer, and then he says something that really grabs their attention. Paul talks about Jesus being raised from the dead. And oh boy, did he get a reaction from that. There are a lot of people who ridiculed him when he talked about Jesus being raised from the dead. How could that be? Others, though, said they wanted to hear more about it. They talked with him later on. Lots of interesting reactions. But the main thing is, is whether people would receive it or not, whether they would reject what he had to say, Paul revealed God to them. 
That was a very important thing for him to do, and it's a very important thing for us to do as well. We need to be revealing God to people. It's the most important thing we can do because it's so important, the most important thing for a person to know Jesus, to have a relationship with him. You know how important it is to you to have a relationship with Jesus. We have the comfort right now already of knowing that our Lord is with us that he will never leave us or desert us. We know that he is with us for the long haul. We have, because we have this relationship with God, because Jesus has brought us to God through his death and resurrection, we know that we have this wonderful future and how we look forward with great joy to the time when we will be with God in everlasting life to be with him wholly and completely. What great anticipation we have for the future because of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why we want to reveal Jesus to others so they can have that same joy, that same participation in our Lord and and relationship with him. So that you can reveal Jesus to people. Show it in the way you live. Show God's love to the people around you. Tell them the good news of all that Jesus has done. Let them know what God has done for you and how he's done it for all people. Let God reveal himself through you as you also reveal who you are, the one in whom God lives. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. May it safeguard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. We continue our worship now with the offertory. this is one of those moments when uh, we really miss being in person. Uh, This is a time, a special time for seniors who are graduating and uh, though we're not in person we'd like to uh, take a moment to uh, think about that and to uh, bring a blessing upon those seniors who are going to be graduating. Today we celebrate with you a significant milestone in your lives as you near the end of your high school or college education. We uh, recognize that uh, for many of you this will mean a a whole new way of living, maybe living apart from parents for the first time, going off on your own and beginning uh, lives as you've been prepared for for by your education. God has led you on this journey of faith in many and various ways. At this milestone in your Christian lives, it's again appropriate to ask you, and I ask you now, seniors, do you intend to continue in the confession of the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to faithfully live your life according to God's holy word? Will you be faithful in the use of God's word and sacraments? And so then answer where you are, yes, with the help of God. Parents, uh, I'd like to address you, especially at this milestone, as they will be beginning a life on their own. We, too, recommit our, our prayers, support, and encouragement. We praise God for the ways that he has worked through you, the primary faith educators in their lives. And may God continue to work through you.
to model and encourage them in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the graduates and their parents. We thank you that you have made them your children through holy baptism, that you've nurtured and sustained them with your word and sacraments, and have molded them by your spirit so that they desire to serve as witnesses of your great love. We pray that they might be shining lights in a dark world. Surround them with people who will give support in their faith life and lead them to opportunities for witness and service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So seniors, uh, we encourage you to be faithful in your prayers to remain in communication with your families, with that you would worship regularly, receiving the Lord's Supper often. And go now with our prayers and with the assurance of God's blessings to you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you now and always. Amen. Our worship continues now with the general prayers of the church. We pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in your in need of you and your wisdom and guidance. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have promised to reveal yourself to us and in us for the sake of the world you love. Help us to keep your commandments and therefore follow your Son, Jesus Christ, in lives of discipleship and obedience. You have promised us through the word of your Son that the pure in heart will see you. May we, as a congregation, as a community of faith, humbly obey and follow in singleness of heart in order to see you in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ. And may others know you by how we love others to Jesus. Lord, we pray for the sake of your church and your congregations, for Mount Olive Lutheran, for Concordia Lutheran, for Resurrection Lutheran, for all of the Christian communities and congregations in Rockford that proclaim your gospel to a world that gravely needs it. Knowing a true hope, not in wishful thinking, but in the sure confidence of your son's resurrection by which we are brought close to you as your apostle Peter tells us. Lord, we also ask that you would be with our communities even as we as a congregation are here for our communities to support their efforts of love and service. So we ask that you would be with the Rockford Rescue Mission, for Carpenter's Place, for all organizations of service that work to meet the needs of your people in body. And may we also help and support them to meet the needs not of just their bodies, but also their spirit, all of which you have created to commune with you through your Son, Jesus. We ask that you would be with those in our communities that are suffering from the virus, from COVID-19, for those who have experienced loss, even in our own midst. We pray especially for Stephanie, the loss of her uncle due to the virus. We pray for Patty who needs healing and recovery. We pray for all of those who are vulnerable through their work and their profession in in lives of service to others. We thank you for those among us who continue to be at work and to serve even at risk to themselves. We pray for wisdom and discernment and love to serve our neighbor 
by where we go and by where, how we stay at home. Lord, we also pray for those that are struggling with depression in this time of social isolation. We pray for those struggling with addictions in this time of social isolation. May your loving arms envelop them through the communities that you have given them. May we as the church, as your hands and feet and mouth, in loving embrace be for them finding ways safely to provide support. Be with them. Comfort them by your Holy Spirit who reveals Jesus to us in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, we also ask that you would be with those governing bodies whom you have placed over us. May we learn to honor our authorities, but may we also pray for them that you would continue to provide wisdom. You have placed people in, in offices of authority over us for the preservation of peace and justice. Where wisdom is lacking, we pray for that wisdom. Where justice may be faulty, we pray that you would strengthen their resolve Lord, we ask and we continue to pray in the name of Jesus, who with you and the Holy Spirit are one God, now and forever. Amen. As disciples of our Lord Jesus and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray as he taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude with our closing hymn.
risen indeed. Alleluia. Just a few announcements. We want to continue to encourage you to, to share this worship service with others and, and to make this, this time known. As we hear in, in Paul's uh, sermon and speech in Acts, we know that God does not, uh, is not limited to buildings built with human hands. He doesn't need anything from us, but he chooses to dwell in our community of faith as he dwells in our hearts through Christ and in his spirit, so we can share that community and share that dwelling place by, by sh loving others to Jesus, showing, as we heard in our sermon. And that means that we should continue to, to share this, this time of worship with others. Um, so we in invite you to, to encourage others to join us in our worship, to share uh, on Facebook or, or through the phone number as we have that opportunity for worship. Um, it, and you could continue to, to be reminded of where that information is by going to mountolivelutheran.com on our website. That'll give you the full list of ways to experience uh, worship with us in this, in this virtual capacity. We also have our Sunday morning Zoom Bible Study Connections Hour, uh, which begins at 9.15 is when we begin to log on and we uh, share time of fellowship and then we have our time of Bible study breaking out into small groups um, in, in through the Zoom um, application program, but it's a wonderful time um, to, to see those faces, even through the computer, and to, to, to continue to gather and share that fellowship over God's word where he promises to, to dwell with us and in our midst, showing us Jesus. Um, and so we invite you to, to be part of that, to share that opportunity with others. Uh, we really are not limited, which is wonderful. We've had um, 70 people uh, on, on those Zoom meetings, so it, it's, it's wonderful to, to be a part of that. Uh, also, we want to make an announcement, uh, an announcement that beginning with June 7, the weekend of June 7, so Saturday, June 6, and, and Sunday, June 7, we are going to relaunch in-person worship services, both here at Mount Olive Lutheran Church and at Concordia Lutheran Church in McChesney Park. Uh, we have a number of, of, of ways and guidelines that we have to do this because we are still in phase two of our, of our five-phase Illinois reopening plan. Um, and th through phase two and phase three, we are limited to 10 people total in, in worship. That includes the pastor. So what that's going to mean, and we'll have a, a much more detailed outline and, and procedures available coming up in, in the next week or so. Uh, but what that's going to mean is that we're going to have lots of shorter services um, that we will sign up for, we'll have people sign up for, so that they can be a part of those those worship services on Saturday and Sunday. So we're going to have a lot more opportunities, uh, times to sign up for, but and this is going to be a time for those uh, particularly that are really just craving to, to be in worship and to see other people, um, to worship the Lord together in a physical capacity, which we know is so important. Uh, that's going to be a, an opportunity to begin to to get back to normal, but it's going to happen in phases as we, as we see our whole state is, is kind of getting back to normal in phases, if you can uh, call it getting back to normal at this point. Um, but we also want to, to stress that we, uh, we understand that people are, some people in our congregation, in our community, aren't going to feel comfortable yet coming to, to worship and, and signing up for these services. And so we don't ever want to... Um, judge those who make a different decision than us. They're using their sanctified wisdom, and we encourage you to continue to use your, your sanctified wisdom and judgment on whether to, to sign up for these services or to stay home uh, and continue to, to, to worship online. And, and because of that, we will continue to record services that just like we're doing now, and we'll have the full service available online so that you can continue to be part of the Zoom Connections Hour online, and you can continue to uh, be part uh, and, and listen to the and watch the service and worship in that virtual capacity. Um, so we're going to have more options available, but we are going to begin to, to have that in-person worship again. And, and it's going to look different, um, but we are uh, going to slowly transition back to normal. Um, through, the, through this time. 
So we ask that you continue to pray for our congregations, continue to pray for the leadership as we continue to, to communicate these procedures and to be ready um, to, to hear and to learn about how you can be part of in-person worship once again. And with that, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you.